Uh, we've heard about Savannah, Georgia, and now I'm going to hear about Jacksonville, Florida. So our next speaker, and, and we hope to have a few minutes left over where we can take some questions at the end, but I want to make sure we get through and you really hear about these success stories um, as we are here this morning. Uh, Renetta Wright is a community and environmental activist. She also uh, lives in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, being a native of Jacksonville. I've talked to her several times over the phone over the years, but first time I've actually met her here at the conference. Uh, she serves as the director of the East Side Environmental Council. The East Side Environmental Council has assisted with remediation of Superfund sites in her community, has provided community organizing support, educated the community regarding uh, site-related exposure risks to the community, and has advocated for health care access and led healthy home initiatives, including community gardens. Uh, Ms. Winetta Wright, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is a great pleasure. I'm coming from another perspective. I'm a community leader. And um, my um, beginning started when I met a trailblazer in my community, and her name was Ms. Brinson. I had the opportunity to meet her. And um, she had to size up who was going to be the next person that would be leading or taking her banner. And I was pleased to find out that she thought that I measured up a bit. So I, that was a, a, a compliment to me. Um, a gentleman named, by my, the name of Michael Bryant, he was with Fresh Ministries, um, he came into the community and he saw a need. Uh, as you know, Jacksonville, if you don't know, Jacksonville, as land mass wise, is the largest city in the United States. That's the land mass. We're the second largest city land mass wise in the world. So we have a lot of ground to uh, cover there. Um, we began to get our group together, and we had three priorities that we had to address. And as we got together in the community, we looked at the issues at hand, and as so many people have already said through this uh, conference, uh, death was one of the things that we were just saturated with. So we came to the conclusion, the first thing that we would address is the health of people. And that has been one of the things that we have been working on uh, since 2003. Uh, I um, remediated my first site, which is the Ralph Steel Drum, and um, we're now in the process of remediating the uh, Curly Key site in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, when we started out, we um, came to the conclusion that the health issues in the community was related to a lot of the problems that we were having in the community. And one of the things that we found out when we partnered with the Department of Health in Jacksonville was that, and once we got the data, was that asthma was one of the leading problems in our community. And the final thing that we found out was that in Health Zone 1, which has uh, seven zip codes, we are uh, in my uh, community, which is 32206, that one zip code had the highest rate of asthma than the whole state of Florida. Mm. So that issue was very imminent. And we had to get those kids and those people that were being, um, you know, exposed to whatever. We have um, seven super, um, super fun sites, not to, uh, including the one that we are um, addressing. Um, so we have a herbicide or pesticide uh, um, site near our community. So we're just on the a brink of first things first. We have to address the issue of the health. And then we decided the next thing is to get fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables to the people in the community because we have a, few, a food desert. So we are in the process of initiating our first um, uh, um, event at a middle school implementing a community garden and an urban core um, co-op. And we
we are very proud to, and we're excited that we are able to continue to follow the guidelines that we have set for the organization. We also um, partnered with uh, Rio, from Rico back. Um, as a as a showcase city, uh, Jacksonville is uh, named as a showcase city, and so in the in interim, my uh, community director asked Ms. Pure for about um, getting someone a consultant in our community in order to help us put things in a perspective that we can follow those guidelines. Uh, we were, uh, Mr. Uh, Mike Hancock uh, came into the community and we started a group called the Jacksonville Integrated Planning Project. And um, we had all um, local communities, uh, some businesses and some um, academia to come in the community. We met um, once a month every Saturday and we did it for like over a year and a half. And so once uh, we invited a gentleman from LISC, it's a national known um, organization, um, they were very pleased at the momentum that we had um, achieved in, in, in um, getting that organization uh, uh, going. We had gotten to the point where we were ready to implement a, 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 dental, a mobile dental clinic and we were getting ready to start our urban agriculture um, process. And um, the people at LISC in Operation New Hope asked our organization that could we combine together because they had just started and we were in the implement implementation stage. So we have joined with um, LISC in Operation New Hope. We are getting ready to sign a memorandum of understanding and this will in, in turn give us the opportunity to do some of the things that we are working to, toward to do. Our main, my main purpose is to get a fully federal funded health clinic in my community. Um, we uh, have a lot of kids that are suffering with asthma. We have a lot of kids that are missing um, school from asthma. We have low grade um, the scores in the schools in this community, their grades are low. And so this is a situation where we need to address the health issue. We have one clinic in our area, and it's uh, for the homeless. So the general public cannot utilize that clinic. And then we have another clinic that's about 25, 30 miles away from our area. So this is why it is so intimate and so important that we address the community and we get a fully federal funded health clinic in our community. So we can uh, help and service the people in this community in order for the youth and the people to continue to live. Because right now we're having funerals two or three times a month and no, it's people right. that are dying from respiratory problems, cancer, and the whole gamut. We are looking to continue our, our, our fight in order to uh, get, um, move on and have process. And um, I have great expectations with some of the uh, people that spoke from CDC yesterday and some of the other people. So we have great expectations that we will have our fully federal funding help. Thank you. Thank you. Has everybody here been to the Gullah Geechee Nation from Jacksonville, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida, or any of those sea islands? I know you have. <laughs> <laughs> or 30 to 35 miles inland onto the mainland to the St. John's River. That's where we live. So generally, if one of the kind of name thing like that, they don't know the Yeti, the Cracky Teeth, the Soul, they don't know the know they don't know the day they somewhere else, so they don't know about it before. You see? So that's our language, which is the Gullah language. On the sea islands, just like many of the images you see here are from Hunting Island and St. Helena Island that are either already wilderness preserves by the state or they are cultural communities like St. Helena that are all Gullah Geechee cultural communities. Next door to us is Hilton Head. Next door is Fripp Island. Next door is, Wa is Seabrook next to Wadmala that you mentioned earlier. That are all what? Why have you heard those other names? Hilton Head and Fripp Island. Fancy, fancy places. Resorts. Fancy places, but they are, right, yes, resorts. So these resort areas have caused a great deal of damage to the environment with no regard for culture and cultural input or cultural impact. 
But in historic preservation, I found it very interesting when we set up the title for this tabletop session, and I said, well, how about protecting and preserving culture and cultural landscapes, cultural heritage and cultural landscapes? They looked at me and said, what is a cultural landscape? That stunned me. Because you hear this term so often within historic preservation, and most times it's coming out of the mouths of those who work for the federal government that I thought, being at another federal entity, they too used the term cultural landscape until I got here. But no. But then when I explained what they said, oh yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> but again, here we have an issue that my community has dealt with all along, which is a breakdown in communication. When I said, how on the children to do the damn thing, I got that in, y'all all started looking like this. Right? Yeah. Because you were like, okay, wait, I don't know if I understand it. Right? Well, that's the same thing that happens, we found, interagency, and especially when you come out your agency into the community. Because you're speaking in what we call alphabet soup, okay? EPA, NPS, NIDIS, you know, the DOT, <laughs> CDC. People are like Sam's S S. Right. Like, like your mouth, start Sam's. There you go, yeah. Sam's, right. So now here it is, like C D C for instance. We have a coastal community C D C. People ask me, Well Queen, why the Center for Disease um here? I said, the Center for Disease. <laughs> they said, Yeah, because you were sending out stuff and you said, you know, you were gonna have a meeting at the C D C. I said, Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> this one is community development. Corporation is also abbreviated CDC. So here, here we have it that if we're not communicating, we're not speaking the same language, we may have the same interests, but not even realize we do. Just like with saying the word cultural landscape here at the EPA and it not meaning anything, but had I said the word cultural landscape at a national park. Oh, good, good afternoon. Come on in, come on in. If I had said the words cultural landscape at a national park service or national trust for historic preservation conference, they would light up instantaneously because that terminology is used there all the time. Now, why I find it interesting that the term cultural landscape is not so well known within the EPA is because when I think of environment, I automatically think of land. That, that makes sense, right? So, if and if you want, you can turn that switch back on for me, please. Um, great, thank you, James. And so, therefore, well, thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, so, here it is. How do you talk about protecting land? preserving land, the various things that are part of the work of the EPA every day, and then not know what a cultural landscape is. So that says to me that the word culture, just like what I mentioned, the other federal agency said they were going to do socioeconomic impact, but they weren't dealing with people. And I said, well, I don't understand. Animals have a socioeconomic impact? I didn't know they spent money. Like, that's what went through my mind. And so when I said it, they couldn't tell me what they meant. Their conversation stopped right there. And they said, well, what did you mean? I said, what I mean is my community's economic structure is going to be affected by whatever policy you come up with after NOAA does a report regarding this area. They said, you know, that's right. I said, so... How are you going to have a socioeconomic impact, but you never do any community interaction to dialogue with the people about their economic structure and how they live from this land and this water here? Same thing here at the EPA. How can we continue to talk about, what was that, the rules that we heard about in the plenary this morning? How can you set some 300 rules a year, she said? that are possibly 5,000 pages long, but is there a rule for culture? Was going to be my question if we had had time for Q&A. Because so far, I haven't seen that in all my years since I knew there was something called an EPA. And my engagements with the EPA, that component I haven't seen except on the back end. Meaning, we have a rule, 
or we have a policy, or we have an interagency thing that we got some money for, and we know we have to go to this place. Now, when we got to the place, the people that live around the place want to know, who are you? What are you doing here? Who's that for What are you going to do? Ah, get out here. Then it's, oh, no, 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 look. We're the EPA. What that mean? We back to alphabet soup. <laughs> right? So now it becomes a situation of, well, how do we get community trust? How do we get community buy-in? How do we get community involvement? Or do you even want community involvement? Because what was just mentioned in the last session I attended about collaborations is, if you educate the people and you work at the pace of the community for the community to fully know what you're doing, to make a true decision on whether they want to work with what you're doing or not, once they realize what it is, they might be against what you're doing. So do you really want to spend the time to educate them on what you're doing so they can make a decision? Because now you might have opposition. So now it becomes a situation where we, this is the landscape that we all have to work in. If we're talking about partnering, you see, I always tell folks, Unless they want to stand, or somebody want to give up a seat, come on, yeah. Don't say there ain't no room. It's a cultural session. We make room. We always find room. We were just discussing the fact that the term cultural landscape that I used for this session was foreign to the EPA. And I was surprised by that because in historic preservation in the National Park Service, in the National Register for, you know, they all use this term all the time. And it's a word that's also often used at the UNESCO because you look at cultural landscapes and then you look at intangibles and tangible cultural resources. But what we find is that when we start to discuss the environment, somehow culture gets left out of the discussion unless you already sent to somebody's community, you get there and the community wants to know who are you and why you are. And now it becomes a term that, again, we're not communicating. Because in government agencies, when y'all say, we have a culture, you're talking about actually what in our world is a structure. You have a way y'all function in here. Y'all ain't kidding to each other, so y'all ain't got no culture. That's how people who are from communities of color look at it. That's not a culture. That's just y'all way of operating. But we have a culture because by blood and historic ties, we have a culture. So again, here's terminology that from one place to the next doesn't transfer. So if we're not transferring what we're saying, we cannot be working together because it's not going to have any effect if I don't understand what you're saying. Any married people here? Y'all, that sound familiar at all? Yeah. Oh yeah. Right? Blended family. Blended family. But I'm saying if you're talking and the other person just don't understand, does it help? <laughs> Not at all. Mm -hmm. Right? You may need somebody else who understands both languages, <laughs> right? To come in the middle and say, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I understand you. Okay, hold on, let me tell her what you say. Okay, this is what he really means. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Well, why he just say that? <laughs> then she says something. Then they say, okay, hold on, wait, wait. Okay, so you know what she said? This. Oh, come on. I would have done it if she said it like that. <laughs> right? So, right? So again, when we have the communication bridge break down or it's never been built because we're not using the same tools here, like the word culture and landscape in an environmental group, we're not touching the word landscape, then how are we working together? Are we even getting to the same place? Because we're not traveling across the same bridge of communication. So that's why I wanted to have this table topic discussion, because I would have loved to be in someone else's session too. <laughs> but I thought it was critical that within all the materials and all the things they sent us, I didn't see the word culture coming up. And I was like, well, why are we coming together? We're talking about collaboration. Who are you collaborating with? Everyone you collaborate with comes from a different culture and a different cultural background. And that is what's going to determine how they see the work you're doing and the level of value it has or the amount of value it has is going to be based on their cultural lens. So until we recognize that, aren't we going to just be having more of these meetings? 
and eating box lunches, and sitting around, and taking notes, and writing 5,000 page rules, and rewriting 5,000 page rules. So I think that this is a dynamic that has been missing. Mm-hmm.